Okay. So today we're going to be looking here at chapter three. In chapter three, we are primarily dealing with what is called adjusting accounts for our financial statements. So what we've done so far is we've kind of set the groundwork for us here in chapters one and two. We got some basic terminology and stuff out of the way in chapter one. We saw our first journal entries in chapter two. And now we're going to move on from those basic journal entries to a little bit more involved situations. Now these aren't anything we can't handle, but they are going to have a few new rules. So it's really important we understand chapters one and two before we dive in here to chapter three. So if you don't feel confident on those chapters, you may want to take a few minutes now, go back, review that material, and then come back to this video. And then this one will make a lot more sense. As I said back in chapter one and two, it is extremely difficult to overstate the importance of these first three chapters. These first three chapters set up the groundwork for the remaining chapters in the course. While you can maybe do some of the later chapters without an, a complete understanding of the other items in the course, it will be very difficult to complete the course without a solid understanding of these three core chapters here at the beginning. So we want to really make sure we spend as much time as we need here early on, get that strong footwork, and then we can move on from there. So here in chapter three, we are looking at adjusting accounts for our financial statements. You can see we've got quite a few objectives to get through today. So this video will be rather long, but hopefully we can make this really useful for you. If you feel like this is longer than you want it to be, feel free to speed up the pace of it um, as you're watching the video, and that is totally fine. And that's one of the benefits, of course, to having this um, recorded like this, is you can kind of go at the pace that you need to go at. If you think I'm going too quickly, always feel free to rewind or you know, slow me down and, um, and do whatever you need to do. Once again, if you have any questions, never hesitate to uh, reach out to me by email or come by my office. I'm always happy to meet with you and try to help you get caught up. I'll do anything I can um, to help you succeed. So with that said, we'll go ahead and hop in here with chapter three. So first thing we want to do is look at this importance of periodic reporting and what the heck is accrual accounting. So those are going to be the first two things we're going to look at here. So if you recall in chapter one, we talked about this idea of the periodicity assumption. And we said back then, this just told us that we could divide time periods in our accounting information to whatever period is useful for us. So we can prepare reports on a quarterly basis, as you see here at the top. This would be simply January to March, April to June, July to September, and October to December. So we'd break this out into four quarterly reports. That can certainly be done and often is done. We can also look at monthly reports. So I can look at how did I do in January versus February? How did I do in March versus February and January? I can do those types of things. What this also allows me to do though is year over year, I can look and say, well, how do we do in January this year compared to January of last year? And as my company is around for several years, this allows me to do what's called trend analysis where we can look in and say, well, all right, our sales went up in the first quarter this year as opposed to last year, but our costs also went up. So are we actually improving or are we getting worse? This allows us to do all kinds of interesting analysis, which is part of the role of our accountants. So we see those are probably the two more common routes. Um, then we have our semi-annual reports and of course our annual reports, which we'll talk a lot about when we start preparing our annual financial statements. This is where we'll prepare things like our income statement, our statement of retained earnings, our balance sheet, and of course, lastly, our statement of cash flows, which we said we will deal with in plenty of depth down the road in chapter 12. For now though, this is what we need to know about the accounting period. It simply allows us to divide out the company's information into whatever time period we deem necessary. Now, one of the most common things you're going to have to really understand in this course that's going to keep popping up is this idea of accrual basis versus cash basis. So what I want you to remember, if you get confused on the test and I ask you which method or which basis should you be accounting for under US GAAP, remember those generally accepted accounting principles, once again, that we referenced back in chapter one, what you got to remember is that it is a cruel world. And I think that's the easiest way to remember this. It's a cruel world, that accounting world, which means that what you are going to be preparing these reports on for me is based on the accrual basis of accounting, not the cash basis. Now, the cash basis is, I think, very intuitive for us. What cash basis tells me is if you pay me cash, I have revenue. And if I pay you cash, that is an expense. 
Easy enough. That is what cash basis says. But I want you to think, do you see an inherent flaw with that when you put this all in the framework that we identified in the first two chapters? And I think very quickly you'll notice that there are some major issues. One issue that we have with this is it violates our revenue recognition principle. Our revenue recognition principle, remember, tells us that I will recognize revenue when it is earned and in the amount we expect to collect. So it has two parts. The first part is the big hang up here though. If you come in and pay me cash, but I have not yet done the work, I do not yet have revenue. Remember, I only have revenue once I've completed the task. So if you hire me to come out and re-roof your house, okay? That's our situation, right? I'm a roofer. You hire me, you say, I want you to redo the roof on my house. I say, okay, fantastic. I'll be out there next week, but you come today and you pay me cash today. Well, at that point in time, I have collected cash, but because I have not yet earned that cash, I do not have revenue. At that point, I have a liability. That liability is of course called unearned revenue. This is one of the key distinctions between the cash basis and the accrual basis methods. Under cash basis, there's no such thing as unearned revenue because as soon as you receive the cash, you book revenue. But the accrual basis says, no, that is not correct. On the same wavelength, right, connected to this idea of the violation of the revenue recognition principle, this also violates our matching principle. What the matching principle tells us, of course, is that the expenses incurred to generate that revenue must be reported in the same period as the revenue. So we need that matching in the same period. But under the cash basis, I record an expense at the time that the cash is paid, whether or not that is when the revenue is received. So we can get this mismatch of revenues and expenses under the cash basis. So you say, well, if we're going to be talking about the accrual basis, why do I even want to know about the cash basis? And here's why. And I think it's going to really interest you because while in this class, we are primarily focused on the corporate accounting, the cash basis method is widely used by smaller firms who are not publicly traded. If you have a mom and pop shop, right? If you run your own deli, if you run your own gas station, if you run your own hardware store, whatever you do, if you're not publicly traded, there's a very good chance that you are preparing your books on the cash basis. So it's worth at least paying attention to and knowing, okay, it does exist. If my family's doing this, they're not breaking the law or something, right? So that's what we want to understand is that this is simply two different basis. If you are publicly traded though, you must use this accrual basis because that is what is in accordance with US GAAP. But remember, U.S. GAAP is primarily only for those publicly traded companies. So we don't have the same restrictions on these small mom and pop shops. Additionally, this cash basis is very similar to how we prepare tax returns. So if you're looking at a tax return, you may see some of the rules or some of the ideas that we're talking about here with cash basis pulling through to those as well. And it's because of a lot of things that go well beyond the scope of this course. So we're going to go ahead and move on now. Now in this case, we're looking at how this actually is going to affect the accounting for different transactions. So here we see on the accrual basis, right? That's our first look. So what happened here? We paid $2,400 for 24 months of insurance beginning December 1, 2019. And that means it's gonna be good through all of 2020 and most of 2021. So. This is how we're going to go through this. So under the accrual basis, what I do is I expand that benefit out over the entire length of time. So I paid a total of $2,400 for 24 months of coverage. If I take $2,400 divided by 24 months, I see that is $100 per month of insurance that I'm actually using. So that'll be the amount I send through to the account insurance expense. I expense something as it gets used. In this case, that insurance will be getting used every month for 24 months. So this is the way this works. $100 is taken in December of 2019, $100 in January of 2020, and on through all the way through the end of November 2021. At that point, the 24 months is expired. 
my insurance account is now gone. I now have no more insurance. Now, what happens if I instead do this under the cash basis? Would I also have $100 in every month coming out? Or would it look a little bit different? So under the cash basis, what we see is we have loaded this entire expense up into December of 2019 reflecting the full $2,400 at one time, not matching it over the period of coverage. This is of course problematic as it leads to an incredible misallocation of resources as we start to look at our income statement down the road. Because what I'll see here is I have this huge expense in, in 2019 and notice no expense in either of the next two years. In this case, this could lead to me believing my performance is unusually affected in this year if my performance is lower, for example, in 2019, causing me to wonder what happened. And then in 2020 and 2021, I may actually believe my business has picked up. But the truth is, maybe I just allocated all of my expenses, paid them all early in 2019. And so I had this huge expense here. And I've got this mismatch down the road. It just leads to all kinds of confusion. But it is, of course, one option, and it is commonly used, once again, by those smaller, non-publicly traded companies. So under the cash basis, of course, the full amount comes out here in 2019 because that is, of course, when the cash was paid. Notice here, we paid for the 24 months of insurance in 2019. So the full amount came out in December of 2019. The full $2,400 has left the building but you'll notice only $100 of that actually got expensed. So if you really wanna think about the journal entry here, what happened is on say December 1st, when we paid this, we would have debited the account, prepaid insurance and credited cash for $2,400. That would be my initial journal entry. Then at the end of the month, I would have debited insurance expense and credited my prepaid insurance account because insurance expense of course is an expense account, which goes on the income statement. And that prepaid insurance account is of course a balance sheet account because it is an asset. So we would see that expense going up, that asset coming down, and this is allowing us to adjust these accounts as we need to, which of course is one of the main topics here in chapter three. Now, the next thing we wanna look at of course is the recognition of revenue, which we have talked about earlier in this video of course, but also back in chapter one when we first talked about our revenue recognition principle. So we said here, the revenue recognition, uh, principle requires that revenue be recorded when goods or services are provided to the customer and, of course, at an amount expected to be received. Now, this last half, everything after the and, is pretty much useless to us for the first half of the semester. We will get there. We will talk about that in depth. I believe it's in Chapter 7 when we look at accounting for receivables. But for now, we're really going to hone in on this first half of this statement. So remember, the key now is we can only recognize revenue when it is earned. Now for the first half of the semester, we pretty much assume that everyone pays us everything they owe us. In the second half of the semester, we'll deal with the situation where we say, well, that may not be realistic. For whatever reason, people may be unable to pay us, even though at the time of the sale, they fully believed they would be able to, we fully thought they would, but who knows, maybe a global pandemic hits, and they lose their job or they lose a lot of their sales and now they're unable to fulfill those obligations. So we'll need to realize how we actually account for that. And of course, that is even more important in today's world where we do have so much uncertainty regarding so many things in the economy. So the next item here is the recognition of expenses. We call this our expense recognition principle or our matching principle back in chapter one. Once again, throwing it back to chapter one, re-emphasizing how important those early, early chapters are going to be in this class. So here the expense recognition or matching principle requires that expenses be recorded, notice, in the same accounting period as the revenues that are recognized as a result of those expenses. This matching of expenses with revenue benefits is a major part of our process of adjusting. And that is, of course, what we will see here in our next couple of slides. So you say, well, what on earth is adjusting and why do I need to do that? So basically, there are four different types of adjustments we will be looking at. The first is what is called a deferral of expense. The second is a deferral of revenue. 
We then will see what an accrued expense is and what an accrued revenue is. And to do this, to adjust these account balances, there's essentially a three-step process. It's pretty intuitive, but we're gonna go ahead and talk it out just to make sure we understand how this works. So the first thing is, before I adjust an account, I need to know what the current balance in that account actually is. Once I know that, I'm then able to figure out what the accounts should equal. This will typically have some amount of discrepancy. So I say, okay, well, my prepaid insurance account has a balance of $1,000, but it should have a balance of $600. In that case, my step three is simply taking the difference between those two accounts, 1,000 minus 600, and that would give me a $400 adjustment. Now please note those numbers are simply made up. They do not come from anywhere previous in the lecture. So I don't want that to hold to hang you up and you get confused and try to figure out where those numbers came from. I simply made those numbers up to help you see how this process works. So here we're looking at our first item, which is our prepaid or our deferred expenses. So what has happened here is we paid for something in advance of actually receiving it or using it. Pretty much any time you hear the word prepaid, this is what we're talking about. Prepaid insurance, prepaid rent. Now this also includes stuff like supplies. And you say, well, what the heck? How are supplies part of this? Well, of course, this is because you purchased the supplies, but you didn't purchase them to just sit them on the shelf in your office. You purchased them to use them. So as you actually use these supplies, they will leave the balance sheet and move to the income statement through the account called supplies expense. So this is the situation that we are looking at. So in this case, what we are going to do is we're going to look at our asset account. We will say typically, right, assets, if they have a normal balance, will have a debit balance. Expenses, if they have a normal balance, will have a debit balance also. So two things need to happen here. Typically my asset will be overstated. So at the end of the period, I look, I had prepaid insurance, right? Another set of made up numbers here. My prepaid insurance, January one of the year was $10,000. Now at the end of the year at 1231, will that balance still accurately be $10,000? If nothing else has happened to affect prepaid insurance, should my ending balance 12 months later still be $10,000? And of course the answer here is no. We've used part of that prepaid insurance over the last 12 months. How much? Who knows? Maybe it was a two year policy. So maybe we've used $5,000. Okay, so I've used $5,000. What's going to have to happen is that asset is going to have to come down. So I will credit my asset account, in this case prepaid insurance that will lower that account balance, and I will increase my expense, in this case, insurance expense. So in this case, my journal entry would be a debit to insurance expense, a credit to prepaid insurance, and that would be our first adjusting entry. Now, here we go. We're going to look at a actual example here. So they tell us fast forward, which of course is our company's name, paid $2,400 to cover insurance for 24 months, began on December 1 of 2019. So this is the same policy we saw several slides back where we had all the calendars listed out for 2019 through 2021. So here we go. Fast forward recorded the expenditure as prepaid insurance on December the 1st, which of course is correct. Now, if I had told you they did something else, you might need to correct first and then deal with the rest of this. But in this case, they've actually done this correctly. So this is our beginning point, prepaid insurance, $2,400. Step two, the balance in prepaid insurance should not be $2,400. Of course, it should be $2,300. And that is because we bought a 24 month policy from December the 1st, to 1231, right? From December the 1st to December 31st is exactly one month. What that means is one of 24 months has expired. So I'll take my 2400 divided by 24, that gives me $100 per month. That $100 per month is the amount that will be moved from prepaid insurance over to insurance expense. Every single month, this process will happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in, 
we've got our debit to prepaid insurance as our starting point for $2,400. But we know that balance should be $2,300. So what you might wanna do is draw a line right here if you've got this printed and just jot down 2300 i'm sorry jot down your 2300 here on your left side of course indicating that we've got a debit balance so we've got our 2300 dollar balance now how do i go from 2400 down to 2300 well of course that is with a credit of 100 dollars. so now that gives me my credit to prepaid insurance with my debit to insurance expense in most cases, there will be a closely linked expense account. And in this case, the expense account that goes with prepaid insurance is, of course, insurance expense. So if we actually wrote out this journal entry, it will be a debit to insurance expense for 100 a credit to prepaid insurance for $100. So they've gone ahead and done what I just suggested a moment ago with the T accounts here. They've jotted down their ending balance in prepaid insurance. They've got their beginning balance and of course their adjustment. So on our balance sheet, what we will see of course is this $2,300 because that is an asset account prepaid insurance. And remember assets, liabilities, stockholders, equity go on the balance sheet. But notice that the insurance expense account of $100 will be showing up on our income statement. And remember, that is because what two things primarily go on your income statement? Revenues and expenses. Now we'll talk later in the semester about a couple of other items that, that actually do get included on the income statement, but here early in the semester, the main two things I need you to know is that your income statement is really just a summary of your revenues and your expenses. If you got that for now, that's a great place to be. We'll deal with the rest of it when we get to it in just a little while. So of course, here is the journal entry that we hinted at just a moment ago with their debit to insurance expense, the credit to prepaid insurance. One other thing I do want to point out here is you will notice that typically whenever we are dealing with our adjusting entries, this will happen at the end of the period. In this case, that is 1231. That is far and away the most common date that we will use in this class. But of course, if I told you a company had a year end at the end of August, then their adjusting entries would need to be made at the end of August. Fair enough. Now, truthfully, you can make these adjusting entries every single month, and a lot of companies will, but in here, we're primarily concerned with these year-end adjustments because it would take me 12 times longer to ask you to do all 12 adjustments. I'll simply normally have you do maybe one or two for a certain time period or for a certain account just to see that you understand how does this work? How do these things relate? And once you've shown me that, then that's good to go. Because if you can do this two or three times, you can do this a dozen times. And so that's what we would see. Now, of course, if you wanted to make this entry every month, you would see this same entry for the next 23 months. At the end of January, same exact entry. At the end of February, same exact entry. At the end of March, exact same entry. And that's what we see here. Now, the next thing we want to look at it's how we are actually adjusting our supply account. So notice here, they tell us fast forward purchased $9,700 of supplies in December. Some of these were used. So notice here, a physical count shows unused supplies equal to $8,670. So what has happened here is we started at 9,720, of course, supplies as an asset. Assets are listed on our balance sheet. Remember, assets, liabilities, stockholders equity on the balance sheet every time. Now, if we started at 9,720, our beginning balance is here. Our ending balance, they told us was 8,670. While that is important, that is not what the question was asking me for. The question is asking me for the adjusting entry to move my supplies balance from 9,720 down to 8,670. So how do we do this? Well, here's the deal. We had supplies, but what happened? We used some of those, which means my supplies have decreased. If I have used those supplies, I no longer have them. Therefore, I cannot use them again. They must come off of my balance sheet. But notice, when this asset comes off the balance sheet, because it's been used, it moves through to the income statement as an expense. And that is exactly what we see happening here. So this difference between these two is, of course, $1,050. That $1,050 will be the amount for our journal entry. 
So we've got our 9,720 minus the 8,670, which is our adjustment of 1050, which of course will give us our next adjusting entry. A debit, of course, to supplies expense and a credit to supplies. Now, on the next piece, we want to look at this idea of depreciation. So I think we all know what depreciation is and I think we all understand it inherently, even if you're not familiar with the term. Because here's the deal. If I gave you an option to use, say you work for me in a large production factory, okay? We're constantly moving big bulky items around. I've got two fork trucks on my production floor. One is brand new. It has nice seats. It has the little armrests that aren't completely ripped apart. It, it moves nice and smooth. And I've got another forklift that's 25 years old. The seat is ripped apart. There are no armrests. It bumps as it drives. It's not smooth. It barely turns. Which fork truck do you prefer to drive? Well, of course, you're going to prefer to drive the newer one because it's nicer. So what we understand inherently is that as our assets age, particularly equipment, buildings, cars, things like that, they tend to become less useful to us. So what we want to understand is that over time, that asset that I bought, say I bought this fork truck, I have no idea how much they go for, let's say $10,000. Okay, if, if you know, and that's way off, then I apologize. But let's say I found a fork truck, brand new, $10,000. Okay, so would it be correct of me, what do you think, if I went ahead and expensed that full $10,000 in year one? So I took $10,000 straight off the bat in year one, knocked that entire expense out right away. Would that be correct? What do you think? So. Let's revisit our idea of chapter one, where we talked about this idea of the matching principle. So remember, when we talked about that, what we were talking about was this idea that our expenses, in this case, depreciation expense is the one we're concerned with, but our expenses in general should be matched up with the revenue they help us generate. Well, in most cases, a fork truck will last more than one year. So because a fork truck will last more than one year, it would not make sense to allocate that entire expense to one year. Instead, I should allocate that expense over the estimated useful life of that asset. So in this case, what I'm going to do is come in and say, I've got this fork truck for $10,000. Under what is called the straight line method, there are only three things I need you to consider. One is the cost. We've got that, $10,000. That is how much we paid for it. The next is our salvage value. Notice our salvage value will have several other terms for it throughout the semester. We may see this is called residual value. You may see this called something like the ending value at the end of the asset's useful life. You may say the estimated selling price at the end of the asset's life is whatever. And you see any of that terminology, I want you to think. And that is my salvage value. That is the next piece of information you need. So the way this works, what you're going to do is take your cost, in this case, $10,000 minus salvage. Let's say we think at the end of, say, 10 years, this fork truck will be worth $1,000. So my salvage value is $1,000. That gives me what is called a depreciable base of $9,000. That depreciable base is what will actually be depreciated over the life of the asset. In this case, we said, I believe this asset was going to have a 10 year life. So if the asset has a 10 year life, we have $9,000 as our depreciable base. At the end of every year, I will reduce the value of that asset by $900. So what you say is, well, what on earth will this journal entry look like? So. In this case, we're going to use the textbooks numbers, but I think we've seen how this works pretty well with our fork truck example. So we'll walk through the textbooks as a second, and hopefully at the end of this example, you will understand how this works. So first, they purchased equipment on December the 1st for $26,000. Notice we have an estimated useful life of five years. The equipment is expected to be worth $8,000 at the end of five years. So that 8,000, of course, is our salvage value. 
they purchased the equipment on 12-1, but it is now 12-31. So here's the deal. In this case, this gets slightly more complicated than our fork truck example because we purchased this in the middle of the year. Notice this purchase did not happen on January the 1st. This purchase happened on 12-1, which means we only owned this asset for one month during the year. I cannot therefore depreciate for 12 months. If I only owned the asset for one month during this year, I can only take one month worth of depreciation expense. So that's exactly what we will see here. Step one, fast forward purchased equipment on 12-1, of course, for the 26th. We have determined a five-year useful life, salvage is eight, and we have noted that this is only good for the one month this year. So over five years, of course, are a total of 60 months. So our depreciable base, of course, will be that difference between the purchase price of $26,000 and the equipment's salvage value of 8,000. That gives us $18,000 that needs to be dealt with over 60 months. What we will do, is we will take that 18,000 divided by the 60 months, and that tells us how much we need to depreciate each and every month. Now, what that means is I will have to come through and actually book $300 worth of depreciation expense every single month. But I want you to look at this journal entry. Before I flipped to this slide, had I asked you for this journal entry, you may have been inclined to tell me, okay, Based on what we've done, I think this journal entry will be a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to equipment. And I would have told you at that point in time, because we've not yet covered this next account, that your intuition is solid, right? You understand what we are trying to do here. But because of some funny accounting rules, we're not actually going to reduce the equipment account directly. What we're going to do is we're actually going to create a new account called accumulated depreciation. Now this is the first of several accounts we'll see like this throughout the semester, and it's a very important account. The first thing that you've got to understand about accumulated depreciation is that accumulated depreciation is what is called a contra account, specifically a contra asset account. I, get, I can almost guarantee you this will be a question on your exam in some shape or fashion. What type of account is accumulated depreciation? It is a contra asset account. What type of account is equipment? It's of course just an asset. So what is up with this contra account? So here's how this works. First, the word contra just means opposite, right? So it's the opposite of an asset, but not in the sense that you think, right? You think opposite of an asset is a liability, but not quite. In this case, what we're saying is this contra account will pair against its original account. So the original account here is equipment. So if you look on your balance sheet, what you'll see is current assets, and you'll see all those listed cash, short-term investments, all the way down, will come down to a total current asset line. Right after that line, we'll hit the long-term or the non-current asset section of your balance sheet. At that point, you'll list all of your things, equipment, buildings, all those types of long-term assets. But here's the deal. We recognize over time that that equipment is not as valuable as it was when we first purchased it. So we're gonna to have to come up with some way to show that. The way that we're going to do this is by placing that equipment account and immediately below that account, so equipment on one line, that very next line will say less, accumulated depreciation dash equipment. That will show us that this is the contra account that actually is bringing down the balance of that equipment. So what this will give us is the information that we need. Let me ask you though, what would be the problem if I directly reduced that equipment balance? Okay, so if I directly reduced equipment, assume I have no salvage value, at the end of this asset's life, what amount would I be showing on my balance sheet for that equipment? Well, if I was directly reducing equipment, which of course is improper, what I would end up with is a credit of 26,000 at the end of the asset's life, once again, assuming no salvage value. So what it would appear to anyone looking at my financial statements is that I have no equipment at all. So let me ask you this. If I am, say, American Airlines, and I have my planes, and they're all incredibly old, 
Okay, I have no idea what they are. I'm not trying to disparage American Airlines or anything. I'm just using them as an example. I think we're all familiar with a large aircraft carrier. Okay, so plug whoever you want. But in this case, we're going to use American Airlines. Say they've got $26 billion in planes, okay? All out on their runways, all over the world, they've got $26 billion in airplanes. But they've incorrectly done their accounting, okay? For the sake of this example, they have incorrectly reduced, say, airplanes as their account directly. So when you look at their financial statements, you see that they have zero dollars in airplanes. Would that make sense to you? Of course not. And let me ask you, even if these airplanes are all incredibly old, even if they are all fully depreciated, they have no more value, right? They can't be sold for very much. They're essentially, they're essentially worthless. You can still fly those airplanes. There's not a law that says once something is fully depreciated, it has to go off into the distance and into retirement. No, you can continue using that old forklift or that old plane. But at this point, you fully expensed it. So you, you won't see that depreciation right off anymore. What instead will happen is they can still use that. Now, let's imagine you try to fly somewhere on my plane. The problem, of course, is I don't have a plane. Are you getting very far on the plane that I don't have? Of course not. So we understand there's this inherent distinction between having an asset that is fully depreciated and gives you what is called a net book value of zero and not having an asset at all, which is the case, of course, with me and my plane that I don't own. So we see this happening here. So this is the reason for this contra asset account is so that we can more clearly see, okay, well, they have the $26 billion in planes and yes, they're fully depreciated perhaps, but they've still got a ton of planes which is totally different than what we might see otherwise if we just reported that airplane account as a zero balance. So it's a very important account to help us stay organized, to help us very clearly paint the picture of what is happening with our company. So at the end of each month, then what we will record is a debit to depreciation expense, a credit to accumulated depreciation. So there is, of course, our Tree. Now, I do want to point out very quickly, we will be talking about depreciation and all sorts of stuff in this class. So you definitely want to get in the habit of including this dash and then what is actually being depreciated. Now, if you're taking the exams on Connect, you will have to do that because it's a drop down. It's a list. You have to pick that one. Otherwise, you won't get it right. If you're taking it with me in class, you may be inclined to forget that, but I will take off some credit. I won't count the whole thing wrong, but I will certainly take off a little bit if you don't give me that description because we've got to be clear when it comes time to prepare our financial statements. If I've got 10,000 accounts in my company, I don't want to have to go through and try to figure out, well, what on earth was that depreciation tied to? Instead, I want to know, boom, it goes to the equipment. This one goes to the building. This one goes to the truck. This one goes over here, right? It really helps us out as we start to prepare our financial statements. And so I really wanna make sure we're keeping all of that detail that we need so that we're able to quickly do that. Now, here's our balance sheet. You'll notice we have our equipment listed under the asset section. This is, of course, an unclassified balance sheet, so they're not actually showing you all the formal formatting where we talked about things like our current asset section with our total current asset line. All that stuff's been left out here for the sake of brevity. So we're simply going with a broad overview of the balance sheet. And in this case, we see, of course, our equipment is, of course, the asset account under the asset section, which you'll notice this contra asset account accumulated depreciation is included here as well. We simply net the two out. This 25,100 gives us the net amount left after depreciation, also known as what is called our net value. So now we're going to look at deferred revenue. So here, this is dealing with unearned revenue, which, of course, is cash received in advance. Someone comes in, pays us before we do the work. Here, step one, fast forward pays a five, I'm sorry, paid a 60 day fee in advance covering the period from 1227 to 224. Okay, so about two months. Cash, $3,000, of course, is our debit on the date that we receive the fee and a credit to unearned consulting revenue. Remember that, of course, is a liability account. So, one of, if not, 
the most commonly missed questions on the first exam is either what type of account is accumulated depreciation, which we talked about extensively now, or what type of account is unearned consulting revenue? Because here's the deal. People hook on the word revenue. Nine times out of 10, that works. Nine times out of 10, if you see the word revenue, it is a revenue account that goes on the income statement. But this is that one time. Remember, you're in accounting now and pretty much everything has an exception. So in this case, what I need you to focus on is that word unearned. That is the key. If it is unearned, it is not earned. And if it has not been earned, it is not revenue. Not now, not ever. Remember that. And here, not what we are focused on are those accrual accounting rules. Those accrual accounting rules tell us we can only recognize revenue when it has been earned. So we see that. Now step two, fast forward, earns payment as time passes. Remember, this is a 60 day consulting fee. So essentially every day that passes, I'm earning 1 60th of that consulting revenue. Of course, I'm not going to record this every single day, but I will need to record it at certain points in time. So at 1231, five days have passed. Remember 1227, 1228, 1229, 1230, 1231. Five days have passed. If five days have passed on a 60 day contract, do you see that we have earned five sixtieths or one twelfth of that revenue? I'll simply multiply that by the $3,000 and it tells me we will need an adjustment for $250. So the adjusting entry, of course, will need to reduce our liability. Which account in that original is our liability? Is it cash or the unearned revenue? Well, of course, cash is an asset, so it can't be a liability, but that word unearned makes this our liability. So unearned consulting revenue is the liability that will need to come down. If I need to reduce the balance of a liability, how do I do that? Well, to reduce the balance of a liability, I will need to debit that liability. So we see that here. Now, at the same time that liability is coming down, the revenue should be going up because I have now earned a portion of that revenue. So here's the deal, $250 comes out of that unearned account on the balance sheet, reducing our liability on the balance sheet, but increasing our consulting revenue on the income statement. So at the end of the, at the, end of the period on 1231, what we will see is that our ending balance for that unearned consulting revenue is $2,750 as a liability, of course. And our consulting revenue on the income statement will now reflect the $5,800 we had already earned plus the new $250 from that adjustment giving us an income statement balance for consulting revenue of $6,050. Now, of course, here is our journal entry. We saw that essentially here by seeing, sorry, by seeing the debit here and the credit here, we of course know what the journal entry is going to be, but this is how this works. Of course, the consulting revenue is an actual revenue account that goes on the income statement. It is increasing with a credit and unearned consulting revenue is of course, and a liability account that is going down with a debit. So we do see that here. Now, the next thing we wanna talk about is this idea of an accrued expense. So this happens when we have a cost incurred that is both unpaid and unrecorded. So here's the deal. The primary example of this that we will be using is something like accrued salaries, okay? So technically speaking, at the end of your shift, every day you go to work, say nine to five, nine to five, you're there, you work. At 5 p.m., have you earned the wages for that day? Of course, right, you did the work. So should you get paid that day? Of course, right? Every day that you show up and do the work, you have earned the money. Technically speaking, if you've earned the money, then maybe you should get paid daily instead of weekly or monthly or bi-weekly, right? So there's all kinds of ways people get paid. Almost nobody gets paid daily, right? But here's what's happening. At the end of every day, what should happen on your company's books is they should come in and actually record a journal entry for the amount that they owe you. So in this case, it tells us fast forward pays employees $70 a day 
or $350 for a five day work week. Salaries are paid every two weeks on Friday. So 1231 is a Wednesday. Okay, so are you starting to see a problem here, right? We have to close our books on 1231, but 1231 is Wednesday and I don't pay you till Friday. So I think we're gonna have to do some splitting here between time periods because what that means is presumably, right, the Friday before this, let's say we already paid is what it looks like. So they already paid, we're clear. At this point, we're worried about this Monday through Wednesday going in the current year and Thursday and Friday going in that next year. So that three days that you actually work, so say we don't get New Year's Eve off, we don't get any paid holidays, or maybe they are paid, right? But there's no days that we're not paying our employees that are typical work week days. So Monday through Friday, you're either working or getting paid for working, right? So that's what we see here. So Wednesday, as of Wednesday, three days of work have been accomplished between Monday and Wednesday. So those three days have to go in the current year as an expense. We see that coming through here in the bottom. Debit to salaries expense for 210, which of course is the $70 a day times three days, and a credit to salaries payable. Once again, you'll notice your salaries expense is an expense account that goes on the income statement, and salaries payable is a liability, which goes, of course, on our balance sheet. So now, when it comes time to actually pay our employees, how much money do I have to actually pay them at the end of the week? So on Friday, how much do I pay them? Well, I pay them a total of $350. So that $350 will include the $210 from Monday through Wednesday plus the $140 for Thursday and Friday. Now, what we've also got to remember is that in this case, right, we pay every other week. So if we'd already paid the prior week, we now need to pay the remainder of this week, that 140, plus all of that next week, which is 350. So I'll take that $70 a day times the seven days, that gives me a total of 490. That 490 will be added into the 210 to give us the total cash payment of $700. But I wanna point a couple of things out here. Notice the salaries expense that we are recording here on January the 9th is for the dates after January 1st, right? January 1 through January the 9th. So that is where the expense comes from. It is the current period expense. Because notice this 210 that we had in salaries expense previously was dealing with that previous period up through 1231. That expense had to go in that period of time. But in this new period of time, in this new year, I've got to get those daily expenses, those daily wages or salaries into that correct period of time, which is what we see happening here. So notice what's happening from the previous journal entries, we're pulling through that salaries payable. So that salaries payable was a liability at the end of the year, which means just because the year ended, I don't get to not pay you for those days, right? It's not like your company gets to say, Okay, well, the year ended on a Wednesday. We normally pay you on a Friday. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it on the next pay period. And then we turn around and say, oh, just kidding, right? You fell for it because we didn't pay you during the last period. We're not going to pay you for those days. That doesn't work, right? That's not legal. They can't do that. Um, so that won't actually be the way this works. What happens is we keep track of that liability into the next year by placing it on the balance sheet as a current liability under salaries payable. Then in the next period, we have to eliminate that liability when payday comes. So we debit salaries payable for 210, eliminating that liability, getting it off the books. We are then debiting salaries expense, increasing that expense in the current period for 490, and of course, crediting cash, which is an asset, reducing that balance and getting it out the door. So, Last thing here, our last type of adjustment, of course, is this accrued revenue. So here, these are, of course, the revenues that are earned in a period that are both unrecorded and not yet received in cash or other assets. So here, on December the 12th, Fast Forward's customer agreed to pay $2,700 on January 10th for future services over the next 30 days. 
So on 1231, 20 days worth of services have been provided and earned, which totals $1,800. So remember 2,700 times 20 over 30, or 20, or I'm sorry, two thirds. So 2,700 times two over three is 1,800. In this case, we have an adjusting entry that will need to increase an asset. In this case, accounts receivable, and will increase consulting revenue. Notice in this case, we have an asset accounts receivable increasing. We've done the work, we are owed the money. Because we are owed the money, we can reflect that in a receivable account. Here we will use accounts receivable. Remember notes receivable is typically written. It's a written promise to receive cash from, some, from another party. It typically comes with interest. We have all those interesting distinctions, but in this case, we're looking at the accounts receivable account. And notice the credit here is to a revenue account, which of course is consulting revenue. That of course will go on the income statement. Well, accounts receivable being an asset will, of course, go on the balance sheet. So here we are at the end of the year. Now, in this case, they actually pay us in the future. So at the end of this, how do we deal with the cash collection? Well, here it tells us accrued revenue at the end of one period results in cash receipts in a future period. So on 1231, we recorded accrued revenue earned of $1,800, and that's the journal entry we saw just a moment ago. But what do we do on January the 10th? But well, when they finally pay us that $2,700, on January the 10th, let's think, would it make sense for me to book revenue of $2,700 at that time? And I don't think it would, because if we did, we would be booking $2,700 in next year and $1,800 in last year for a total of $4,500 on a $2,700 contract. I don't know about you, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So what we're gonna to have to do is really think this one through. Well, what we've done is we recognized, notice, part of this revenue in the previous year with accounts receivable. Now, when it comes time to actually receive the cash, a couple of things are gonna happen here. One, cash is increasing, no doubt about it. We're getting paid, we are receiving cash. Cash is an asset, assets increase with a debit, debit to cash for $2,700, easy enough. Now, two other things are happening also. In the event that they pay me, do they still owe me? And I don't think they do, right? If you paid me $2,700, you don't still owe me $1,800. So accounts receivable has to come down. Accounts receivable will come down, of course, by that $1,800, reducing it down to zero, getting rid of accounts receivable. Now, this is important because if I don't do that, then I'm liable to call my customer up later and say, hey, we were looking at our records and it looks like you never paid us. And are you gonna have a happy customer when they say, oh no, we did pay you. I'm not sure what you're doing, but your records are wrong. All right, you're probably not gonna have a very happy customer. So we wanna make sure we reduce that accounts receivable down to zero. Now the very last thing here is claiming the last piece of this revenue. So remember, in this case, we had a 30-day contract. Two-thirds of that elapsed before the current year. Now we're into the current year, which means we need to pick up that last third of that revenue. In that case, there's a total of $900 left that needs to come through on the income statement as revenue. In this case, that will be consulting revenue, and that is what we see here. Now, this is a fantastic chart. I'm not going to tell you you have to recreate it on the exam or you have to memorize it exactly perfect. I don't think that's necessary. I think that is extreme overkill. But if you're a little bit confused and you kind of want a summary of what on earth is happening here, then I think this is a great place to go. Now this is exhibit 3.12 in your textbook. And what we're seeing here is we've broken it into the two main areas, deferrals and accruals. So when we're looking at our deferrals, we've got a deferral of expense and a deferral of revenue, and then we've got an accrued expense and an accrued revenue. Okay, so one of each. And they tell you broadly what that adjusting entry will look like. Now this is where I wanna take a second and point out a couple of rules about adjusting entries. So when we're talking about adjusting entries, there are several rules you really wanna key in on. Now the first one, I don't really count as a rule for adjusting entries because it's true for all journal entries. And that is that total debits must equal total credits. Now, I wanna point out very quickly here, because this seems to confuse people a lot. What I am not saying 
is you have to have the same number of debits and credits. In this case, we have one debit and two credits. This journal entry is equally valid as any other journal entry. But what you'll notice is my total debits of 2,700 is equal to my total credits of 2,700. This is what we're talking about, right? Not the number of actual accounts. I could have one debit and 415 credits and that's perfectly fine, right? I can have um, 415 debits and 82 credits. That's fine. It does not matter. What has to equal though is the total dollar amount. So what we're going to see then is our first rule, same as any other rule, right? Debits equals credits. That has to be true. It's a fundamental rule of counting. There is never in my experience, a time where debits and credits will not equal and you've done something correctly, right? If your debits and credits don't equal, it's always a sign that something has gotten messed up. You either transposed a number, you've forgotten a transaction, something has happened that has caused this not to balance. But typically you can use that as a sign to say, oh, okay, I must be forgetting something because I don't balance. It's a really good way to check all of your journal entries. Now, the other part of this, of course, is dealing with the actual rules for adjusting entries. The first of which is you will always have at least one income statement account anytime you're dealing with an adjusting entry. The next is you will always have at least one balance sheet account when you're dealing with a adjusting entry. And the final rule here is you will never, ever, ever use the cash account in an adjusting entry. If you see the cash account in an adjusting entry, it is not an adjusting entry or that adjusting entry is wrong, right? It will never be properly done so that you have a journal entry with the cash account that is actually a adjusting entry. So I wanna point out a couple of things. This entry right here that we just looked at, debit to cash, credit to AR and consulting revenue, notice, we do have a balance sheet account. In this case, we actually have two. Cash and accounts receivable are both balance sheet accounts. We do have a revenue account, which of course is an income statement account. So we satisfy those two rules, our debits equal our credits. But notice the glaring issue here is that cash account, which tells us this is not an adjusting entry, this is simply a regular journal entry. But if we look here, this is an adjusting entry. Notice, accounts receivable is an asset assets go on the balance sheet. So there's our balance sheet account. Consulting revenue. Revenue goes on the income statement. There's our income statement account. Our total debits equal total credits. We did not use cash. Here's a flawless adjusting entry. So you're going to need to get where you can identify what is an adjusting entry and what is not by applying those rules. So in this case, once again, I strongly recommend you take a couple minutes, just glance this over, make sure it makes sense to you. It's a really good summary. But once again, I'm not going to have you recreate this on the exam or anything like that. Now, here we go. Here's where all of our work finally starts to really pull together and this gets really, really interesting, okay? I know it's been a blast so far, but it's about to get even better, so just hang on. So here we go. First thing, we're looking at our, our trial balance. You'll notice in this first two columns, we've got our debits and our credits, but you'll notice this is unadjusted. What that tells me is this is at the end of the period, sure, but these balances are not the balances that are going to be going into my financial statements because we've done none of those four adjustments we just spent the last 20, 30 minutes talking about. So we wanna really make sure we understand where these things are coming from. Next, that next column, and it's what we are using as our adjustment columns. So if we debited an account, we'd simply have a debit in that column. If we credited that account, we simply toss it into the credit column. We then go from left to right. So in this case, we had nothing in accounts receivable. We debited accounts receivable. We now have $1,800 as a debit to accounts receivable. Notice with supplies, we had a debit. We added a credit, which is actually a subtraction to that account. So 9720 minus 1050 is 8670. You'll notice here at the end, we have a total of 47,610 in debits and credits. And you'll notice at the beginning, we had a total of 45,300 in debits and 45,300 in credits. Now, a couple of things I wanna point out. One, your total debits and credits will not necessarily be equal from your unadjusted to your adjusted, right? Those numbers will change, and they did here, right? Before, we had 45,300, now we have 47,610. 
but what will be equal is the debits and credits within that overall column. So your unadjusted trial balance, everything balanced out to 45.3. Your adjusted trial balance, everything balances out to 47,610. That is the equivalence you're looking for. Don't try to figure out, well, why is this different than this? Well, stuff's happened, right? Of course it changed. So don't get too locked into this idea of everything equaling because in certain cases, especially here, it is very common that this is going to change between your unadjusted to your adjusted, okay? So do keep that in mind. Now, the next thing we wanna look at is now that we've prepared our adjusted trial balance, we are now ready to prepare our four financial statements. So the first thing, of course, is that income statement. This is our first financial statement and a pillar of this course. We will talk about the income statement this semester until you are tired of talking about the income statement and then we will talk about it some more. So get ready, right? It's a huge topic in this course. I really need you to understand it. It's gonna make your life a whole lot easier if you spend the time early on figuring out where these all accounts all go, what makes them go where, then the rest of the course is really just a plug and chug type situation because you've understood the framework. If you don't memorize the rules and understand them and learn them, then you're in for a really difficult time the rest of the semester trying to guess or just trying to memorize huge lists, but we cover hundreds of accounts in this course. So if you're trying to memorize each individual account, I think you're going to have a very difficult time. Instead, learn the rules, learn the categories, and you'll be able to drop any account title I give you where it belongs. So that's the way that I would prepare and the way that I suggest you go about studying for this class. Now, step two, we're going to prepare our statement of retained earnings using our retained earnings and dividends from the adjusted trial balance. And of course, we'll pull down that income from that income statement done in step one. After we've got our statement of retained earnings, we've updated the retained earnings number. Now we're ready to prepare our balance sheet using asset and liability accounts from the adjusted trial balance. We'll pull that updated retained earnings from uh, step number two. And finally, we'll prepare the statement of cash flows from changes in cash flows for the period. Really at this point in time, uh, I need you to know a very limited amount about the statement of cash flows. Really all I need you to know is this, operating, investing, and financing. Those are the three sections on the statement of cash flows. That is the order they are prepared in, and that is really all I need you to know. And if you forget, right, don't worry, we've got a mnemonic for this one called OOPS, I forgot right? Operating, investing, and financing. And that'll be the, the mnemonic we use to remember the order of preparation of that statement of cash flows. Now, once again, you do want to remember the balance sheet. Once again, does cover assets, liabilities, and stockholders equity, our three main areas on it. And of course, our mnemonic for preparing our financial statements in order is what you would probably be doing if you weren't, you know, vigorously engaged in this lecture which is sleeping. So we say, I should be sleeping. So ISBS, I should be sleeping income statement is of course the I. Statement of retained earnings is of course the first S. The B is the balance sheet. And finally, the last S is of course your statement of cash flows. So that is what we will see. Now here they're showing you how all of this ties together. So I don't know why they do this in this order. I think it would make far more sense to switch these two and go down, but for whatever reason, they go up. We'll work with it. So you'll notice here on their income statement, they've got all of their revenues. They pulled that, of course, off their adjusted trial balance. Those numbers simply drop in. You get a total revenue number. Next, they've got their expenses. Thankfully, most trial balances are organized in a way such that your accounts are pretty much grouped with the stuff they need to be or they should be at least if, if you've got any kind of good accounting software, it'll do this for you typically. And it's of course doing this by account number. So most companies will follow some kind of rule. In this case, it looks like assets um, are the 100 accounts. It looks like their liabilities are 200, their equity is 300, their uh, revenues are 400, their expenses are 600. So you'll have some way to identify these accounts and typically an account number is the easiest way to do this. So we've got our income statement prepared. We've got all of our revenues listing next to all our expenses gives us our net income. In this case, it looks like we've got a brand new company. So their beginning retained earnings balance was zero, but during the year, and they added in $3,785 in net income. 
you'll notice they did pay a dividend of $200. That $200 will come out of retained earnings. Remember, retained earnings is the sum of this year and all previous year's net income minus any dividends paid back to shareholders. This is the earnings, right, the net income that has been retained by the company. That's why it's called retained earnings, right? So if I pay that cash back to the owners, I have not retained it, which means it will reduce this retained earnings balance. In this case, our ending retained earnings is $35.85. The last thing we've got to do is throw together our balance sheet. So in this case, we're looking at an unclassified balance sheet, which is fine. They just list all of their assets and give us a total asset number, but you'll notice very importantly, when we get to the equipment account, we've got 26,600, or I'm sorry, just 26,000. But you'll notice that accumulated depreciation of 300 is netting against this, giving you a book value for that equipment of 25,700, giving you total assets of 42,745. We'll follow through similar procedures for liabilities, giving us total liabilities of 9160. And of course, our equity section will simply pull in our common stock number of 30,000. And and this 3585 for our ending retained earnings, of course, comes from our statement of retained earnings. This allows us to see our total equity is 33585. And because of our basic accounting equation, which tells us assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity, what I'm going to do is add my 33585 to my 9160, and I'll come out to a total of 42,745. This 42,745 will indeed equal my total assets of 42,745. And if it does not, that should tell you you have a problem. Because remember, this is called the balance sheet, which means it should balance. It is not called an unbalanced sheet. Please do not turn into me at any point ever a balance sheet that does not balance. I'm not saying you have to get it perfect, right? But please try to find a way to make it balance. Because if you don't have it balancing, it will be wrong. Okay, I will give partial credit, but you know for sure turning in your exam, for example, that you are not earning all of the points on a balance sheet if it does not prove out that total assets equal total liabilities and equity. Now, the fact that it does equal, does that mean for sure you got 100% on it? No, right? You could have gotten something put in the wrong section. You could have forgotten a journal entry that made everything off but an equal amount. There are issues with this, but you have at least given yourself a chance to earn full credit if you prove out that equivalence. Now, the next thing that we want to look at is our closing process. So at the end of the year, we need to reset our accounts so that we are ready for the next year. We're going to reset things called revenues, expenses, and dividends. So we have an acronym for this. I strongly recommend that you use it. This acronym is called CRED, C-R-E-D, PALS, P-A-L-S. So we will close, which is the C in CRED, revenues, expenses, and dividends. So CRED is close, revenues, expenses, and dividends, meaning we need to bring those balances down to zero. PALS, these are our permanent accounts, and I bet you can guess what they are. Assets, liabilities, and stockholders, equity. So CRED PALS, C-R-E-D, P-A-L-S, will help you remember which accounts you need to close and which accounts you need to leave alone when it is time to close at the end of the period. Now, one thing I wanna point out, this textbook, like many introductory textbooks, does use this account called Income Summary. What you want to know is the accounts, revenues, and expenses will be closed through income summary, but the dividend account will go directly to retained earnings. So we'll see how this works. We've got our income summary that deals with our temporary accounts. Okay, typically these will be our revenues and expenses are the accounts that will be running through income summary while our asset accounts will be left alone and dividends will be a direct reduction of equity. Now, here's the deal. I think we've talked about this before, but just to be sure, I want to really drill this idea home. Income summary is essentially net income. And it's the easiest way to think about it. So what I want you to consider is, will dividends reduce net income? What do you think? Now, hopefully you remember from back in chapters one and two, we discussed income and we discussed dividends 
at least briefly. And what we said back then was for something to go in the income statement, at least at this point of the semester, it needs to be either a revenue or an expense. Well, the fact that dividends are listed separately from revenues and expenses should tell you that dividends are not a revenue or an expense. And we discussed this and we asked the question, why? Why are dividends not an expense? The company is paying cash. Shouldn't that be an expense? And the answer to this was a rather convoluted one that really requires that we understand the information in chapter one. And what we said was that using dividends as an expense would violate several principles. Okay? The first is that matching principle. Because the matching principle says that expenses must be reported in the same period as the revenues they are associated with. Well, what creates a dividend? You, the company, paying cash back to the owners of the firm. Okay, so what that would mean is for a dividend to be an expense, that initial purchase of my stock by my shareholder must have been recorded as revenue. But was it? Because revenue is something we earn by providing our normal services. Is our primary function of our company selling our stock? No, it's not. So if it's not, then we might also be violating our revenue recognition principle in order to make this where we have a revenue to match a dividend expense against it, it doesn't work. So that's the situation we run into. And this is why dividends cannot be treated as an expense. There is no revenue to match them against. And if there's no revenue to match them against, they are not an expense. Instead, what we say is dividends are a direct reduction of equity. So while we'll take revenue and expenses through income summary, we will take dividends directly to retained earnings every time. And that's what we'll see here. So, First thing we've got to realize is how this works. Well, if I'm closing an account, what that means is I'm resetting that balance down to zero. This allows me to look at my income statement from one year to the next and see, okay, well, this year we had $100 million in sales, but next year we had $62 million in sales, right? It's a little bit easier to see than if I have cumulative numbers running through all the years and I have to calculate difference columns and all kinds of stuff. Oh my goodness, those income statements would be atrocious and far less useful. So. Here's the deal. What we're going to have to do is understand those normal balances really, really well. Remember our acronym for normal balances, DEAD, D-E-A-D, -E debit, expenses, assets, and dividends, credit, right? So CLOR, DEAD is for the debits, and CLOR, C-L-O-R, is for our credits. We credit liabilities, owner's equity, and revenues. So there are our acronyms. What I need to know is those normal balances backward and forward so that I can close these accounts appropriately. If I don't know my normal balances, I'm very likely to double an account balance instead of reducing it to zero. So it comes time for the end of the year. You go to close an expense account and you debit the expense. What just happened? Did you reset that account? No, you just doubled that expense account. So congratulations, you just reduced net income by a tremendous amount. You think your bosses are happy with you? You think your shareholders are happy with you? Probably not. Conversely, you come in, you accidentally credit a revenue account. Yeah, net income just shot through the roof, but you didn't actually make those sales. So now you've committed a form of fraud if it was intentional. And if you didn't, well now, because you increased revenue, you increased income, so now you get to pay a lot more taxes with money that you didn't actually earn. So not a really good situation either. So we really wanna make sure we're getting these normal balances down so that we don't end up with some debacle at the end of the year. So first thing, we want to close any credit balances to that income summary account, close debit balances to income summary. We'll then close income summary to retained earnings, and finally, we will close dividends directly to retained earnings. You'll notice here we've got some expense accounts. Of course, all of our expense accounts have a debit normal balance, meaning they will all need to be credited with a debit to retained earnings and a credit to, I'm sorry, with a credit to, um, to the expenses, a debit to income summary. So in this case, when you add up the 300, the 16, 10, the 100, all these, Right, so you've got all of your debit balances and your expenses. 
added together gives you a debit for 43.65 to income summary. For your revenue accounts, you've got a total of 81.50. Those revenue accounts will need to be debited, so they are being debited here, and they will be credited to the income summary account. In this case, you've got a credit of 81.50, a debit of 43.65. That gives you a balance in income summary of 37.85. Well, income summary is not a real account, right? It only exists to help us with closing. So I've got to immediately wipe out that income summary account. If I had a credit balance in income summary, then I will need to debit the income summary account and credit retained earnings. So there we go. Debit to income summary, credit to retained earnings. Now, the last thing, of course, is getting rid of those dividends. Well, dividends have a normal balance of a debit. So in order to eliminate them, I will credit dividends and debit retained earnings, giving me, of course, an ending balance and retained earnings of $3,585. Now, next thing we want to look at is our post-closing trial balance. So we've gone through, we've done our entries, we've done our adjustments, we've gotten our adjusted trial balance from our unadjusted trial balance and our adjustments. We then went through, we prepared all four financial statements. We then prepared closing entries. Now we are dealing with our last trial balance called a post-closing trial balance. Here's the deal with it. What account do you expect to see on the post-closing trial balance? Will you have any temporary accounts, revenues, expenses, or dividends? No, they will not be here because you just closed them. Because you just closed them, they're all zero balances. We don't put zeros on financial statements, so they don't show up at all. So when you look at your post-closing trial balance, you'll notice cash, permanent account, asset, accounts receivable, asset, supplies, asset, prepaid insurance, asset, equipment, asset, accumulated depreciation, contra asset, accounts payable, liability, salaries payable, liability, unearned consulting revenue, keyword here, unearned, liability, common stock, equity, retained earnings, equity, right? All permanent accounts. And that is the reason they are still around on our post-closing trial balance. One more time, you'll notice total debits equal total credits. And so we've got a trial balance that is in balance. So we're pretty happy with that. Now, here is once again, our accounting cycle. This is essentially what we've done. First, we analyze transactions. We then journalize them. So we actually record the accounts, debits and credits in a journal. We then post those to T accounts, prepare the unadjusted trial balance. Then we adjust and we'll post those adjustments. Preparing the adjusted trial balance comes next. After that, we prepare our financial statements, income statement, statement of retained earnings, balance sheet, statement of cash flows. Then we close accounts. We close those revenues and expenses through income summary, which then gets close to retained earnings. And we close dividends directly to retained earnings as it is a direct reduction of equity. Next, we prepare the post-closing trial balance, which we said will only have our permanent accounts. Remember, assets, liabilities, stockholders, equity. It also means it looks very similar to our balance sheet. And finally, we will reverse and post. This is not very useful in this class. It is simply included in the text, I believe, to give you a 10th step because people like 10 better than nine. So that's why they include it. If you wanna see how this works, look in the appendix in 3C, but it will not be required for anything in this course. So do keep that in mind as well. Now we wanna look at this idea of a classified balance sheet. I've mentioned this several times throughout, but we want to make sure we understand how this works. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is this is where we break our financial statement into multiple pieces. So we'll look at a balance sheet. We'll have assets typically listed on the left, we'll have liabilities and equity typically listed on the right. If you're looking at this just in a one page format, sometimes it's just straight down and we've got assets listed up top, liabilities and equity down below. However you wanna look at it or imagine it is fine. Um, both, both formats are commonly used. Now, in this case, what you wanna realize is you're going to start with your asset section. In your asset section, what you want to look at is first your current assets. Your current assets are prepared in a certain order. Cash will be listed first. Short-term investments will be listed second. Receivables, okay, specifically those accounts receivable typically and your current notes receivable will be listed next. After that will be listed your inventory. 
followed by supplies, followed by your prepaid expenses. Now, I wanna point something out here. This is prepared in what is called the order of liquidity. Liquidity tells you the speed of which you can turn something into cash. That is what we wanna know. How fast can this item be turned into cash? The sooner this can be turned into cash, the higher on this list it goes. So let's think through this list and let's think through this order. First, cash. How long does it take to turn cash into cash? Not very long as it's already cash. So cash is always listed first. Next is our short-term investments. These are things like, I want you to think of a day trader, right? I buy a stock for eight cents. I sell it three seconds later for 11 cents and pocket the difference, right? I do this all day long. Those are extremely short-term investments and they are very quickly turned into cash. They will go right after cash. Next, we have our receivables. Okay, so we made a sale, but we have not yet collected the cash. It's sitting in a receivable. That is slightly more liquid than inventory, which comes next, which has not yet been sold, which is slightly more liquid than supplies. Now, once again, I wanna hit on this idea of inventory versus supplies for the most complex situation we can have, which is an office supply store. Think of Office Depot, Office Max, all those types of places. They sell office supplies. Is there a difference for them between inventory and supplies when it comes to their balance sheet? Now we've talked about this previously, but once again, the answer is yes. Remember, it's all about the intent. So if the inventory is purchased, right? If the item is purchased, to be sold to our customers or created to be sold to our customers at his inventory. If the ink, the paper, the printer, the chair is bought to be used in our operations, then it is supplies. Okay? Maybe not the chair, it'd probably go under office furniture. Got a little carried away on my list. But we're thinking about things like printers and paper and copier ink and pens and pencils. Anything that is being used to run the business is going to go into this idea of your current assets listed under supplies. Okay, So that's the fundamental difference. Inventory primarily meant to be sold to our customers, whereas supplies are meant to be used in our ordinary operations. And finally, we've got intangible assets. Oh, I'm sorry, we have our prepaid um, expenses. This is going to be things like prepaid rent, prepaid insurance, all those types of things. Anything prepaid will be our last current asset. Now you say, well, how on earth am I supposed to remember cash, short-term investments, receivables, inventory, supplies, and prepaids? Well, lucky for you, we've got another mnemonic. So hopefully you're not tired of all of these yet, but we do have another one. This one says, can, she, so can being the cash, she being the, sort, the short-term investments, really being, of course, our receivables. Invent, so can she really invent? The invent, of course, being the inventory. Something, of course, being our supplies. And then prepaids being practical. So can she really invent something practical is our mnemonic. And in this case, that is cash, short-term investments, receivables, inventory, supplies, and prepaids. That is the order that you will list your current assets in every single time. I don't remember if connect takes off if you get these out of order, but I certainly do if you take a paper exam. So make sure you're getting those in order, okay? Now, we've got our next section here, which is non-current assets. Non-current assets are things like long-term investments, plan assets, and intangible assets. So long-term investments typically are investments that are held for more than a year. I'm not going to get into all the investment rules. They get quite nitpicky and they're very niche. Um, and we don't need to cover them in this course. Next, we look at our plant assets. Plant assets being things like um, machinery, equipment, buildings, anything like that could go under this plant asset category. And finally, intangible assets, which we'll deal with, I believe in chapter eight. Um, that sounds right. Chapter eight, I think is correct. Um, but we'll deal with those later. This is primarily things like patents, goodwill, uh, trademarks, anything like that. And that's what we're looking at with intangible assets. But those, of course, would go under this non-current asset section as well. Now, with our liabilities and equity, we simply break our liabilities into current and non-current. Once again, anything current is expected to be used or paid for within a year. Anything non-current is to be used or paid for in more than a year. 
And of course, equity, we don't split current and non-current because equity doesn't have a time period. It's just is equity. So we see that here. Okay, now most operating cycles, less than a year. Um, for companies where it is more than a year, then they may use this idea of current or non-current as an operating cycle, not just a year. So if I'm building only aircraft carriers for the US Navy, well, that might take me a couple of years to build one of those things. So I might not report on a yearly basis. I might report on an operating cycle. Maybe it takes me two years to build an aircraft carrier. So I report over a two year period. That is not common though. So it is not the focus of this course. Once again, current assets are expected to be used or paid for within a year. Um, our long-term investments, long-term investments are expected to be held for more than a year or the operating cycle plant assets. These are typically tangible. You can touch them. You can reach out and grab onto a machine. You can reach out and touch the building, right? They're tangible. Um, and so we see that intangible, of course, meaning you can't reach out and touch them. These are things that are used to produce or sell products or services. They lack physical form. So here's the idea. A patent is a piece of paper. But is that piece of paper what's valuable? Or is it the idea contained within the patent that is valuable? Well, of course, it's the idea, right? A piece of paper is just a piece of paper. But the idea in, ingrained in that paper is what is so important with a patent. A trademark is the same thing. Goodwill, when you pay more for a business than it's actually worth, same thing. All those types of things are intangible assets, and there are several others that we'll deal with later in the semester. Of course, current liabilities are things that are expected to come due within a year or the company's operating cycle. Long-term liabilities, more than a year or the operating cycle. Equity is, of course, um, just the owner's claim on the assets. It can often be referred to as the net assets. Um, so that's that. Now, last couple of things before we wrap up this chapter. First, we've got to look at what profit margin is and see how we calculate this. So once again, we've got a formula, thankfully, for us. This one is fairly simple. Profit margin is simply taking net income divided by net sales. So in this case, they give us uh, the information for both Visa um, and MasterCard. So for Visa, they've given us net income and net sales information to allow us to calculate the profit margin for MasterCard. They've just given us the profit margin. So you can see here two years ago, Visa had a profit margin of 36, sorry, 46%. Now they're down to 36%. So it looks like they are becoming less profitable. And the same trend appears to be affecting MasterCard. They had a profit margin of 39% two years ago versus the current year, they only have a profit margin of 31%. So it looks like for whatever reason, these firms are becoming less profitable. If you look at Visa, what you notice is they are actually increasing their sales by quite a bit. So they went from 13, I would assume this is, yeah, 13 billion. So figures are in millions to so 13,000. A million is 13 billion. So we've got about $14 billion in sales two years ago, all the way up to 18 billion now. But you'll notice their net income is hardly any more than it was two years ago. So while they have actually increased net income, it's not proportionate to the increase in sales, which is why their profit margin is steadily declining. If they don't figure something out pretty soon, this is looking to be a negative trend for the company. Don't really like to see this. Um, truthfully, right, both are still positive, so they're not in too much danger yet, but we definitely want to figure out what's going on here. Because while our sales are increasing, we've obviously got some expenses that are increasing more quickly than those sales. And the same thing seems to hold true um, for MasterCard as well. Now, the very last thing in this chapter is this idea of the current ratio, which just tells us if we're going to be able to pay our debts in the near future, if it looks like we can. Now, in this case, we've got to take our current assets simply divided by our current liabilities. So we've got current assets over current liabilities. In this case, Costco comes out to 0.99, Walmart comes out to 0.86. Truthfully, both of these companies are quite concerning to me. You don't really ever want to see a current ratio less than a one. As it indicates, the company may have trouble meeting their incoming obligations. Now, there is a more conservative ratio that we'll talk about in a couple of chapters called the quick ratio or the acid test ratio. Um, it does a little bit better job of showing exactly how this works because the problem with the current ratio, of course, is all of your current assets. 
this includes things that probably shouldn't be included that we'll have to take out with that quick ratio that we'll see later in the semester. But for now, we'll stop here with the current ratio. And that, of course, is the end of our coverage here on Chapter 3. So with that, um, that wraps this up. So if you have any questions, please feel free to either come to class with those questions, shoot me an email, or come by my office. I'm always happy to meet with you and help you uh, figure out anything you're struggling with. So good luck. Thank you again. I'll see you next time.